planning commission meeting tonight on June 16th, 6, 603. Um, in house, I have a Diane and that's it. And everyone else is online. Uh, ah, there she is. With Patrick, we have a quorum of three. Uh, so we can conduct business. Uh, Robin's here and Regina is here. Um, it's really a work session, but we do have um, minutes to go over and uh, audience for visitors. There's nobody present, anybody online that's, there's no one else online. So uh, I'll skip that. Um, any additions or amendments to the agenda, Robin? No, John. Thank you. Uh, on to the minutes. So we had a joint meeting with the trustees on May 19th. Uh, we were issued draft meeting minutes. Um, has uh, Does anybody have um, any comments on the draft meeting minutes? Yes. Whoever did the corrections in red um, needs to learn uh, the fine points of English grammar. Um, any place that they that they corrected the capital S to a small s needs to be corrected back to a capital S because they're referring to the state of Vermont. Um, I would like Patrick Shield to be included and not excluded from when he arrived because I think that's important for the planning commission to know when Patrick came. Hi, Patrick. When he was up. Because um, he has just shown up. 605. 605. Not bad, Patrick. Well, uh, the link. Oh, Good well, that's, that's why I showed up. I just, my ears were burning. Okay. So, <laughs> I, I thought it was important to keep you in the minutes because they, they were going to put you out. Um, you have, <laughs> um, I don't have them in front of me. I do have them. Okay. So, um, well, I was told I didn't, I did or did not need my computer. Um, so, uh, that's the, the corrections that need to be occur in the uh, portion for the trustees. And I did not see anything that reared its ugly head to scream at me to say that anything was wrong with the rest of it. So, um, so I'll take a motion to um, uh, approve the minutes with the corrections uh, made by Diane. I'll make a motion. Second. Patrick has a motion. Diane second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor of the minutes as corrected, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And with that, uh, we continue with our work session. Uh, on the land development code, we are closing in on uh, what is uh, referred to as final edits and, and some other things. So, uh, Regina, I will pass it over to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, so I have like 5,000 windows open of things to share as we move through these things here. But, um, so uh, first up, is chapter eight. This is a super small section on nonconformities. And I'm not going to actually open up the text because I don't think it's quite as important as just showing you um, the map that Melanie put together, um, where she was able to sort of highlight um, lots that would be under that size. It's, a, it's an eighth of an acre lot. Um, and basically point being, um, you really don't have any vacant small lots. So it's sort of irrelevant. We can take out that minimum lot size and just move on with the state statute as it changed. Um, so the question I have for you real quick, Regina, is some of those lots were like, Minuscule. Um, yep. I, I think some of them were under the eighth of an acre. Um, should we can be concerned that somebody wants to put something on, let's say, a tenth of an acre or less? I mean, it, it, we're literally talking about putting on a shed, and that's it. And some of those those little triangles that were in her map. Um, but I did have a question about for Robin. 
is that there was one of those little squares behind uh, the current 197 construction. Um, so I thought that was all part of the that project. Okay, to see if there's actually a small square that's not part of that project behind um, down the hill toward the the brook um, is a little concerning. <laughs> um, Robin, can you give me screen sharing ability? Invite me again. So what'd you say? It's all remind me again. Oh, can you give me screen sharing ability? So go yeah. to participants and it'll show the list. And then if oh, yes. you hover over my name and go to more. It's in the, it's in the, it's yes. The I'm, I'm still working on the, um, the other <laughs> format we used to use. Make co-host or host, which would you like to be? Uh, co-host. A lot of the, the, which is my command. Makers okay, thank you. Are in the village center, but there are a few outliers. Okay. Diane, where are you? Okay. So go down Pearl street. So in this map, go down Pearl street, go down like, Pearl street. In this way. Yeah, you're good. Keep going. Okay. Uh, all right, so oh. that per, see that little purple? Okay, that's the brook, but that's the purple square I'm talking about is, where are you going? Come down Sorry. right there, that square. This it's one. Lower, lower center, right. Yeah, the current 197 construction is going on where that white roof is. And so there's this purple square. And I'm kind of going, wait a minute, between those two developments, the previous one and this one, how is that <clears throat> not part of that project or one of the projects? Or is it um, by somebody? I, I think it is that in my memory is in that area there gets pretty steep. So maybe undevelopable. I think so. It yes. might be, you know, but I'm sure it's owned by one of those, one of the two there, um, unless it's just well, everything down to the brook is a little steep. Um, and, and it's very steep. Some of those places, it's scurly, scurly oh, yeah, steep. Yeah. Um, what, what? yeah, but I don't know why, but for whatever, whatever reason, it does show up as a separate parcel. We're not seeing all the parcel lines, unfortunately. And I don't think I have the ability to mess with this map, although I might be able to. Um, well, it's just a, a question for, for later, because to me, it's... Okay, there are a lot of lots where this one owner owns both lots. Mm -hmm. Like like my neighbor next door had both lots and she subdivided or didn't have to subdivide. She just sold off the back lot. <clears throat> I always assume she owned both. Well, she owned both of them um, that they were conjoined like my property is. Um, hers was never conjoined. So she had free reign to run uh, without that complication of dividing her property. So I'm wondering if this is that same technicality, but when we approved the project, I know they went down to the creek and we're supposed to do a yes. review wall and stuff. So I'm finding this intriguing um, since we approved that they do a retaining wall to maintain the integrity of the brook. Yeah, and I do find that interesting because the time comes over the brook in spots. Um, I can't, it was early on my tenure. I can't remember what project it was, but we were looking at it and they had included the square footage of ownership, but some of it was in the town. And so we had that discussion. So I vaguely remember that, but, uh, I don't want to digress too much down, but you know, it's, well, my... it, it, I just, it, since we had the map available and we're looking at it, um, uh, but a lot of the other ones, that one's twice the size of some of the others that are on this map that she shared with us well it, here's a european perspective a lot of places in europe at the minute they're putting eight to ten homes on an acre i know a tenth of an acre is four thousand three hundred and fifty six square feet so um we have some and we have some districts we need five thousand square feet 
and it it always depends on the lot you know if the lot's 10 feet wide and it's not going to work you know the closer it is to square the easier it is to develop a lot i guess but um i don't think we should discount it just because it's a tenth of an acre so what what we we're not really taking action on anything here somebody was just trying to point out that the items that we're trying to approve in chapter five may or may not have any actual map any land that <coughs> uh, that it applies to right so spend any more time on it then okay yeah it's just we're just it's in chapter eight we're just getting the existing small lot definition um in line with the change that they made in state statute and since you've got water and sewer in the village the idea is to just remove the um the the idea with this statute originally is that if you have lots that exist that are smaller than an eighth of an acre and you don't have water and sewer those lots should automatically merge with an adjacent property under the same ownership because in theory they're too small to develop i think generally speaking in essex junction this is not really an issue well some of the some of those lots that you got pictured are um backyard shed size um so i'm surprised they aren't conjoined with somebody's neighboring lot or maybe they are they're just they just never um, like my neighbor next door never joined them they're just two pieces of property um and nobody ever thought about well it's only big enough for a doghouse why should i care all right none of that matters right? okay so yeah with the law it's a state law that's that's basically saying if there's already a lot that exists and and you can build on it, you you you're able to build on it. so fine right we, we like that we're promoting as much building on, uh, you know, especially when the state says you shall, promoting okay. building on, uh, you know, on, on small lots or tiny houses. You know, somebody could bring a tiny house and maybe it's not up to us to decide. We're just saying, okay, we now have a new set of rules that apply to those small lots. If it works, great. Okay. That's what we're saying. All right. Carry on. Okay, awesome. So moving on to chapter five. So this chapter is um, a lot of your process um, stuff. Uh, final edits have been made in here based on Chelsea's comments. Um, and uh, I will just um, quickly go through this. Let me share it. Okay, then this also just um, is one of the chapters that I was able to go in and do the city of Essex Junction changes and switching to the development review board. Um, so that, uh, you know, it's just annoying. It's not that hard, but it does take, <laughs> does take time. <laughs> for, for, for some of the typos and such, do you want me to just email you those? Because I've got... A long sheet of them. That would be awesome, Diane. And probably a lot more productive than pointing them all out, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, that would be great. Um, send them along. We're gonna, yeah, yeah. So we're not here to be here. I, I don't. Why do what? That's why I'm putting it forward. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't send them already. I thought about it. <laughs> 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 I thought about it, but I had a bunch of people calling me for a darn. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> okay. So, to that, yeah. okay. Okay. in right. doing so, looking for, I mean, I mostly did find and replace, but then I went through to hopefully make sure I caught everything. Um, I found some things that are uh, unusual, and so I edited them. This is an example. So, your current notification process. So, when there's a proposed development, there's a state a statute requirement to notify abutting landowners. Um, your LDCs talk about doing that within 150 feet of the project. That's not in state statute at all. Um, so, I edited this in accordance with state statute. Um, Robin, I don't know if you saw this or had any issue with it, but. Um, I did not have any issue with it. Okay, awesome. 
Um. So your edits, your edits just remove the the distance definition, and you want all the butters to. So if I'm two blocks away, I don't get a announcement because I'm not a butter, not a butter. Right. Um, it really is um, all a butters um, absent of right of ways. Um, and really, it's kind of important to stick with that state statute definition because those are the folks who actually have the opportunity to appeal down the road. So it be, can be confusing if more folks are getting in a butter notice that aren't uh, actual. State statute gives them uh, standing automatically and other people might be interested, but they're not gonna get noticed. Right, and that's the reason why the um, uh, Z sign should be on the front of the property so that people generally driving by, it's in their neighborhood, they know that something's going on. And I doubt anybody really reads legal notices in the paper, but those are that's the point of having that and also the agendas being posted. And we do check to make sure that the, the, the notice is up every single time. Okay. Technically, I think they use the free press. Um, also, because of that 150 feet, there was this concept in there that if a if a development is like on the inside of a lot and uh, the 150 feet keeps you in your lot. You don't notify the abutters outside of that, and that's not that's not uh, legal. Fair enough. So, so, Regina, it, so there was a line in there about private lane. So if you live in a private lane, it's everybody on the private lane gets a notice. So we have some private lanes that are good block long. So. So if somebody, let's say, lives on another one block paved street that's already accepted by the village, they wouldn't get a notice because they're not next door or across the street or behind. I, so I kept that sentence in just because it's a little bit above and beyond. If you want to do that, you can do that, but it's not in state statute to do it that way. It, it's not actually asking you to send it to the abutters. It's saying anybody who has the rights to use that street, right. which I think is fair. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. DRB, DRB, DRB. Um, okay. Uh, so another thing that I just found in here in the process stuff, it is allowable in statute to, instead of issuing a written decision for an application, you can just use the minutes from that meeting as kind of the official record of what the facts of findings and conditions of approval are but it's a really poor practice. Um, so I took it out. Okay. Do you guys write decisions or do you rely on the minutes? Uh, we write them and the, board, the chair signs them. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, those are just number changes. Uh, I think those were some of the changes from um, so this is a question I had. Um, so when uh, you're a city, the land records are still at the town, right? And it's the town assessor that you're filing a copy of the permit with? I believe for now. For, for now. So it's the, yeah. that was my question on page 25 is that K, which is where it is, is that it talks about the town clerk, the Essex town clerk. And my question is, is the town of Essex maintaining the city records? Now, I understand that anything be, you know, in, in history here would, of course, be there. But what's the, going to be the procedure moving forward, which, of course, is either in a few short weeks or, or next year, depending on how, how that goes. So how, how is that? You know, what, what are we legally required to do? I don't know what we've contracted with the town to do. Do you know, Rob? No. I think, you know, we're going to keep the status quo moving forward. Um, what is it? Uh, finance will be with the town until 2023 or through the town until 2023. Jess is um, 
moving through that slowly, the new city uh, finance director. Uh, so I think we'll segue slowly to that point, but we're not yeah. there yet. I mean, we'd have to renovate to Lincoln. Right, because there is no, there's no land records there right now, right? Right, and that yeah. vault is not probably quite suitable for Okay, so achievement. there you go. Raj just, just not Raj. Raj. in. Yeah. Thanks, Raj. Only for a year. Thank you, Raj. <laughs> but, you know, do, okay, so... We can't change the process in the LDCs then. If this is the process that it's going to be for the next year, for now, it's got to stay this way. Yeah, we can we can make minor modifications as we need. Yeah. We may need to decide that tonight. So we can give maybe we can give applicants an update as to where it really needs to go when that happens. Absolutely. Okay. 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 Uh, I, I'll just say that it would be helpful for us to have um, some staff notes on on how the process really works, so that when the applicants come in, maybe maybe Rob is already taking care of that for them. But it, it's sort of seamless to us, except that somebody's going to ask. We need to somebody's going to ask. Gonna ask. Gonna yeah, they'll be asking that at, uh, at the city offices. Yeah. Good. All right. What? Uh, where are you? Okay, was pretty far down. The... That was uh, yeah, it's pretty far down. So, uh, where are you currently, Regina? I am on page thirty-six. Um, so I think this might be a different section than what Diane is talking about because, and that's not surprising. This was the process of recording the land records is probably in here a bunch of times, but so long as we know that we don't need to change it right now, we're good. Um. Okay, that's not a new comment. We have talked about that before. These are just the changes and all of the timeframes are adjusted accordingly with state statute now. Sorry, I'm moving through this quickly. Um, what was that? You, the, I'm just looking at that because I, I had a client ask me how long their approval lasts for. And I, I believed it was a year, but this conditional approval lasts for two years. Are, is that is that going to change the normal approval and who's giving conditional approvals that's the yeah. so the future drb will give a conditional approval and that will last for two years or until somebody comes in with an abuse yes and so that's a good question like let's say right now you approved a conditional use let's say nine months ago, if that approval has an actual date on it, um, that I would advise this village to ask for legal counsel on that because this just changed in state statute effective immediately. Um, so assuming that conditional use, whatever it was applied for, if they didn't build it yet, um, and you issued the permit six months ago, do they still have two years from six months ago? They might. Um, and why hold them to the year that they had originally? Um, now that statute's changed anyway. So if you have um, a normal project that doesn't need a conditional use, is that also uh, a two year approval? The statute changed specifically for conditional use and site plan. Um, and to be clear, statute doesn't require you to put an expiration on either of those. You can just approve them indefinitely. So that's a possibility. But if your uh, regulations do put an expiration that expiration date cannot be any less than two years time. Um, right. And the, the reason for this change uh, really came from a housing development project in Morrisville where, you know, it just takes a lot of time to put the housing project together with all the different funding sources. Mm -hmm. And by the time they got the project together, the year had expired they forced them to go back and get a conditional use and they put all kinds of new conditions on the project. So um, the longer, the better. All right, thanks for that. Okay.
So uh, moving along here, um, this is not new. We talked about this before. Um, basically, there's just notification requirements to uh, VTRANS when you're doing a project on a state highway. Um, this is not new. We talked quite a bit about what um, what you'd be asking for folks if they're going to be building public infrastructure with the intention of the city taking over the public infrastructure. So that's what that was in there. Uh, same it's common though, isn't it? I mean, don't most neighborhoods get constructed such that the municipality will take it over after it's completed? No, not recently. And I don't know what recently I'm going to say very roughly for an, a few decades. Uh, municipalities have been much more in the camp of not taking over infrastructure for new subdivisions. <laughs> and I wouldn't say that's a good thing. Um, they don't from, allow it. They, want, they don't want to maintain it. They right. don't want it. Yeah, but it it is one of the many things that's sort of adding to making housing so expensive, right? Because now all that cost burden is on those individual property owners. And Robin, um, is there uh, a process for the intaking agent for the municipality, namely the um, planning department to understand or be told what the intention of the applicant is as to whether, uh, you know, roads and, curbs and sidewalks and everything. I mean, we have, we make them build it to the village standards anyway, right? Yes. So it's just a matter of ownership and maintenance. Mm -hmm. Generally, John, uh, we changed it, oh, six or seven years ago um, for Autumn Pond, you know, uh, Village Walk, Village Haven. So and we said that they shall be private, but built to village yeah. standard. Uh, the one that was a little bit different was Village Haven because we wanted to have the water line because people in Athens Drive, especially the, the higher point, had very low uh, water pressure. So we wanted to keep that so that we could improve uh, the water pressure for people on Athens Drive. But generally, we just thought about it and we thought, no, this is not something should be a burden on us. That So we've asked, uh, you know, PRDs coming in. We told them that our preference is that they will um, own the infrastructure and maintain it in perpetuity. So you're basically forcing new development to be uh, have homeowner agreements and all kinds of things. Well, they would anyway, you know. But yes, we're we're adding to we're, we're adding to the documentation. Let's put it that way. EUD. I mean, I don't know what I think about that. All right, well, keep going because it's not. Yeah, I got I got mixed feelings on that as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it, it it's tough. It definitely is situational. If it's going to be a dead end in the middle of nowhere, that's really hard for the village to take on. You know, there's lots of lots of different thoughts, and there's a lot more to think about this when you have sort of a sprawling suburban town, which you are lucky to not have. Um, okay. Uh, here's the site plan approval to two years. Just scrolling through here. Um, no, Regina, we're following along sort of with you, but we can't read the screen, so. Can't read the screen? Well, what? I suppose we could be sitting over there. Oh, you want me to blow it up? No, it just... No, John, John's just complaining that he's sitting at a bad angle to read the screen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry, John. <laughs> that, that thing to more toward us because there's nobody here to see it but us. Scott's got it Scott's got it There you go. John fixed it. We're good. Carry on. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Signs, we've talked about this quite a bit that there is a lot we could do to sort of get signs in compliance with this um, Supreme Court decision of a couple of years ago. And it is not likely something we're gonna be able to do before trying to just move this set of changes forward. Um, okay, so appeals. This is the other thing that you'll sort of see changed because um, it previously, 
under the old model, appeals go to different places. Now that you've got zoning administrator appeals are going to go to the DRB, DRB appeals are going to go to the environmental court. So text is sort of changed throughout just to just to cover that. Um, uh, ADUs, we already talked through all of these changes. We just um, brought this up to code, um, up to statute, and um, made clear that these accessory dwelling units should not go through the complicated conditional use approval process. It should just be a zoning permit, just like single family homes. Um, so that's all in there. There's the existing small lot. Again, it's defined in chapter eight as well as defined over here. Um, okay, so here we are with our favorite planned unit development. Um, this is again, the process section for planned unit developments. The standards live over in chapter seven, section 723. Um, uh, last time we talked about this, the purpose, the new objective sort of purpose statement didn't quite work right. Does this appear to be what you're looking for? I, I, I think it does. Um in that it gives us that flexibility if we want more or if we want to um, flesh it out a little bit more as to what we mean. And I think it gives us a lot of creativity, flexibility. Right. Okay. Very good. Um, okay, all these other changes are the same, swapping out the terms. Um, all right, same thing. Um, also, uh, to your question earlier, John, about do other approvals change to the two year time frame? What was not changed in statute is the subdivision because those just sort of follow a very different time frame based on when you have to get the plat recorded and all of that. And it's really not tied to development as much. It's just really the subdivision of land. So that stays the same. Um, there's the VTRANS notification part. Um, these, I think, are just some of the final changes that Chelsea had. Uh, Regina? Uh, right yep. Here. Okay, where you've got on this, this copy has the GIS geospatial data portion in there. This yep. that you sent us still had that uh, unstruck. So should I go by these papers? Because the other ones would have a different number in the bottom. This says page 55. Um, I think <clears throat> that had a, been a different number in the papers uh, that you sent us for review yesterday, the day before. Hmm. So should we go by, well, I'm going to go on like page 25. There's no page 25 in here. It starts at 33. So, uh, so I'm, I'll, I'll go through and compare to see if some of these things were already been done. So my question ended up being is that if something is corrected, or struck here in this copy. Is this is this what's real, or is the papers, the chapters that you sent us for review? Which, they sh which are ones are more real? They should be exactly the same. So what I'm looking at is what I sent you. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, maybe when you printed it out, the page numbers. No, I, I didn't print anything. Oh. Uh, I, I was look, doing it online uh, with what from the email that you sent. And sometimes the you know the track changes show up differently for different people depending on how you have it set and what you're looking at. For the full markup is typically what I'm showing you. But this um, it should be that this old language about how you would get the digital 
documents should be struck and it's these three options. Okay. And these are, you know, you'll see this a few times throughout the document. Right. I just, I, I don't want to send you stuff that's already done. Okay. It, because that, because of the papers that were sent or the chapters that were sent. Okay. What if I just like print you a full set of everything? Would that help you? And then you could do your editing from that? Um, sure. If you're willing to Good do idea. That. Yeah. Let's just plan on that. As, as we get through the chapters, I will print and just either drop them off or mail them to you. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Just a last one of the comments. For what it's worth, I just downloaded what you sent, Regina, and it matches what you're showing us, but the preview, when I preview it in my email, it like doesn't match at all. Oh, interesting. It doesn't even go down to page 55, so Maybe it depends if you're downloading it and viewing it in Word or viewing it online. Or I have no idea. Okay. I just opened it. I didn't. I didn't download it. I just opened it. So mm. that could be the difference. Yeah, that could be a challenge. Um. Okay, and I should I should be sending you guys PDF files, and then that would that should solve the problem. But um, I'll try to do that going forward. Okay. Um. Same question about the land records. So we got that uh, solved. Let me just make a note. Um, okay. More just final edits from Chelsea. I think we're close get to the end here. I don't think there's anything else big stuff to talk about in here. Um, this is not new. We talked about this last time, pulling out these standards that are not standards from the PUD, from the one of three PUD sections in here. Um, okay, <clears throat> last time we talked about the PUD um, regulations. Um, so as it exists today, um, <clears throat> I believe folks are required to come in for the conceptual, and then they're required to come in for the final approval stage. And it really, the language is like, it's up to the applicant if they want to come in for a preliminary and in-between stage. You folks felt like it would be helpful if they're in certain circumstances, it would be helpful if you had that preliminary stage, because there's a whole lot that can happen. Um, and by the time they bring you final, it feels too cooked to ask them to change anything. So, um, uh, before I had offered that when you see something at conceptual, if you felt like just requiring that they come in at preliminary, you, could, you would have the authority to do that. But that felt a little too squishy. So I put in, if the development includes six or more units <coughs> in more than one structure, or six or more lots. And this basically just mimics your subdivision definition that uh, defines what's a minor subdivision or a major subdivision. So does this work? Um, Regina, does this impact design review as well? Um, it's kind of, two distinctly different things. Okay. So design review is gonna kick in if geographically you're in the place where design review kicks in. And I think basically the way that we've worded that for like any application. So even if you're coming in for a subdivision or a PUD, it would also be reviewed under design review if it's in that uh, overlay, if it's in the village center district or the overlay. Um, It's interesting that we're not necessarily defining at what point in that process that comes into play, but um, I have I mixed feelings about this. I feel like as this board becomes the DRB and all we're going to be doing is approving, 
are reviewing plans, why not just see them have the two separate stages, I guess? But that's kind of like my opinion. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of benefit of just the two stages. And so the previous language gave you some flexibility, like if it felt like something that really needed a third time, you could do that, but. Here, here's the issue from the developer's point of view, which Gabe and you kind of used on the last uh, little project where it was a little different than normal, is that you have to spend a lot of money just to get to the uh, preliminary phase. You know, you, you need engineers, you need, you need a lot of people to lay things out. And so maybe what we say is you have to do preliminary and you have to do final. But if you want to come in for conceptual, that's the one that's optional. And so if you want to know whether it's worth your time to spend the money to get the engineering and the rest of the things done that, that get you to preliminary, come see us for conceptual. We'll tell you whether we think it's going to work. If it doesn't work, don't spend the time and energy and money. Yeah, they can also come to audience for visitors and get a sense as well, and that's happened right. in the past. But I, I think... You know, we there's a risk for us and a risk for the developer applicant if they get some kind of a, you know, yeah, that looks like a neat idea. And then they show up at final and expect it to be approved and you don't like it. You know, that, right. that puts us both in a position we don't want to be in. Well, the last conceptual flop it on the table here, what do you think as a visitor? They thought they had gone through everything up to final at that point in time, and that was their perception. Right. So I'm saying don't allow that to happen anymore. Make, if, it's, if it reaches this level of you know, six or more, then we want to see a preliminary, a full preliminary, and then a final. But, but you're welcome to bring any, any idea you have in with, with less... Uh, you know, rigor, if you want our opinion. I might have misspoke when I said the three stages. I meant I didn't like the idea of going straight to final. Right. I like the idea of seeing it at least once and then again at final. So, yeah. I like I mean, it. they, I like they do thoughts. it at their risk. That is their risk. But mm -hmm. really, it, it turns out to be really hard for us to sit here and watch somebody go through that much effort to make it happen if, if we're really don't like it. You know? Well, right. we, we've had some applications that we've continued because we felt not to charge them again because they weren't quite done. And we wanted to see, yeah, we gave them an assignment to, to fix X, Y, and Z, which they did. Um, and then we're completed on the next meeting. So yeah. how is that different from you know, uh, doing a conceptual or preliminary, and then I've tried. I've tried to describe. Sorry, Dan. I've tried to describe that to them that if they want to go to final, it'll probably be tabled, and they'll come back, and come back, and it makes a lot more sense to start. You know, with a schematic and get a sense of what you know, yeah, well, what the DRB thinks they should do. My opinion is that if it's if it is essentially a major major development. Some, you know, we're saying anything over six or more units or six or more lots. If, if it reaches that level, then we want to see it for preliminary and final. That, I mean, that's that's really what we want. Yeah, right, it makes at sense. a minimum. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Right. So, so if there's, if there are three possible times you can come talk to us, and, you know, the, the first one can happen to anybody anytime, the conceptual. Um, and it can happen for small projects where they can do a conceptual and then go right to final. But if it's more than six units or more than six lots, we want to see the, the full preliminary and the full final. Do, do we want to say six lots or do we want to say six units? Well, it, because if it was a PUD, it would still be one lot. Right. I was thinking something so i think you put the words uh, a little bit more eloquently than i would have robin but the idea my, what was coming to my mind is that new development off of maple street that has four units four four housing units on the single lot 
I feel as though that's something that we would want to see a preliminary development plan for, um, but that falls below this definition and it wouldn't, wouldn't trigger. That's actually six units. It's, it's six. six? six. I yeah, it's it six. Six. They haven't, they haven't built the front two yet. I don't think. I thought it was yeah. four. Yeah. I think it's, it, it's, it's going to be six. A, yeah. yeah. Six. I think it's a broader brush. If we said six, six or more units. Six lots also seems pretty, pretty large. Rather than just say six or more lots. Yeah. So if we just say units, and it doesn't matter whether they're in one also. structure or, you know, or how many lots, six it, lots, it's a catch all. Um, okay. John's, and, John's chewing, so he's thinking about this. Yeah. Regina, is, is this similar to other towns in the area? Cities. Cities. Yeah, so a, a breakdown between a definition of what you consider major or minor and major goes to the three stages, or I think most people do have their PUDs written that way. You The conceptual sometimes is optional or not, otherwise it's required, so you're going three times. Um, otherwise, it's if it's smaller than that, it's got a two-step process, so that's pretty typical. Um, how folks are defining what's major and minor, I don't have that super clear in my head in terms of whether this is lining up with that or not, but it probably um, it probably works fine that way. Okay. Um, Just seeing where we line up with other. Yeah, and I think communities. the only hesitation from my end is that um, Again, for housing developments, we're trying to streamline this, right? And not make it as complicated and process heavy as possible. But um, I think we've done enough changes in the LDCs to be clear that if we're talking about um, a project that isn't going to be subdivided, it's a multifamily one structure project, it's not coming for PUD approval. It's gonna come for site plan approval. Um, and I think that makes sense because it's a lot, there's a lot less to think about in terms of whether you're like how you're laying out new lots, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. So I will get that edited. Um, okay. Waivers. We've talked about that before, just sort of tightened up that process. Um, okay, then back into the sort of public works pieces and just have all the final edits in here from Chelsea. And then back to this half acre, one acre situation. So I think we're um, back to the original way that, th that this was worded and I'm just gonna run it by Chelsea one last time, but I think we've got these figured out, these two sections at this point. Um, and talked about this is not new either. Talked about this last time also about just trying to get the wetlands regulations well, well lined up. And um, then that's not new, that's new state statute section that is added in there as well. Um, okay, any other chapter five questions? Okay. Uh, oops. I don't know what I just hit. Stop share. All right, let me find what's next. Chapter six. Okay. Chapter six, zoning districts. So, uh, multifamily residential. So, um, the edits that you'll see in this section um, 
I think are all the final edits that we need to satisfy what I just said, which is basically to um, not push a bunch of stuff through the PUD process unnecessarily. Um, so really where this came into play quite a bit is in R1, R2, uh, M, F, one, two, and three. So, um, and as we talked about last time, MF1 especially um, is pretty well built out, but I just wanted to sort of look at this one more time with you folks. Um, because you really see the sort of effect. No, oh, shoot, hold on, sorry, wrong screen. Okay, so all in here is the multifamily one zoning district. And you can really see very clearly um, the sort of impact and result of um, what I assume is all of these were approved as planned unit developments. Uh, let me know if I'm wrong, Robin. I'm just I'm just sort of making that assumption. Um, so they're multifamily in the sense that they're uh, attached as opposed to detached, um, and they're kind of clustered. So you end up having this open space sort of all around it. Um, on the one hand, today, looking at this, um, that looks like a lot more land for housing that could happen. And it is possible to shift and adjust the, um, sorry, let me back up for a quick second. So typically when these happen, the amount of density that you can get for a whole big lot is tightened up into these smaller spaces. And then the rest of this is in theory preserved and protected from development into the future. Unless it is within the authority of the municipality to increase the density of the zoning district in the future. And so if you do that, it is possible, unless this land is really protected through any um, actual deed, deed and covenant language, um, you could put more housing in here. Well, Regina, where you've got, well, where you had your, well, you can keep where you've got your arrow right now, you have up there, oh. where's mm -hmm. Indian Brook. Yep. Um, there, there's a small problem. It's Indian Brook, um, right? So it's got it's got its own wetland and all kinds of other stuff in there, which is why they clustered that development um, because they couldn't build on the creek. Okay, uh, sort of a thing. There's the, a waterway going down through the other. Yeah, and then water there's section. a waterway through this other. This one, one too. It's like a big lot. Now that that was supposedly going to be given to the school, but there's a small water problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and your like cursor this. is right over yeah, the right, major transmission power line. Yeah, there's that too. So, you know, Got it. topography challenges, which is, which I'll give credit to the developers. They use the topography challenges to cluster things and let the topography challenges alone. Um, yeah. I will say it, it's used heavily by the surrounding neighborhoods as walking trails and, uh, Open, you know, it's open space, but it's more recreational trail stuff than anything. There's a um, tennis courts and a swimming pool and a big open field that are part of the yeah. uh, planned unit developments, which is really nice for them. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it's kind of a nice little forest on the other side. But it is swampy. It is swampy. So if you want to go look for polywogs, right there is a good <laughs> spot. Okay. So. Um, I would argue that it's doing a good job. It's doing, doing, open space it's doing and, a really good job of exactly yeah. what we want a wetland and some other things to do, to be a wetland and do right. what it should do to protect us. So should we develop that? Even, even when I saw the, the plan to put a school on there, it wasn't really the best idea because it's kind of like, yeah, there's a small little island, but then the rest of it's all wetland. So mm. kids going to play? 
mm-hmm. <laughs> the problem, which is why it never went anywhere, and the schools didn't take it. Yeah. Um, so there is there are a number of little screens that are these two there, and then um, down at the bottom left of your screen there is an open field. And that's part of the back field for ADL. Right. And those are also uh, extremely well, wet during the well, spring. Well, there's the other topography challenges there too. Yeah. yeah. Another stream down through there. So. Um, Anyway, uh, the, the point is well taken. If there were parcels that could be, uh, you know, somebody came along and increased the density uh, or, or recognized that as PUDs maybe they should have had been given more density uh, and you could figure out a way to do it. I'm sure somebody would. But, but you know, frankly, in, <coughs> as a mix in with the rest of the single family homes all around it on, on their own lots, uh, you know, it, it's it's really a nice example of suburban, uh, you know, different things, right? Because you've got townhouses, you've got single family homes, you've got groups of things, that, and uh, you know, could it be a little denser? Sure. You know, if we can, if somebody figures out how that's going to work, and it, and they've got density available, and you know, I think we're we have seen. Uh, let's see, it's on. Lane, uh, just um, right about where it springs off of where Rosewood comes in. They did act. Somebody, yes. somebody bought, put three or four houses in a little tucked away backyard, and, yeah. and you know they're fine. They look like they've been there forever, but they're. Happy. How do you spell it, Briar? Uh, yeah, it's just. Um, it's, oh, there. It's just the bottom okay. road that you're. Yeah, I, I, oh, I see. Right, the open field that looks like a sideways Vermont. It's just north of that. Off the end. Yeah. Well, so Briar Lane and Rosewood uh, join each other twice. So go down to the other end of that. Uh, yes. Well, yeah. In here. Yeah. So all those houses that are tucked back in the woods there are are um, new additions. Yeah. Okay. That's stuff on the left. It's Whipple went Drive and yeah. Francis Whipple Drive and stuff. That yeah. used to be somebody's backyard. Yeah. I see. Okay. So it has happened. There, there have been uh, a number of places where uh, additional density and additional housing units have been tucked in. Okay. Um, all right. So that that is helpful background information. Um, and your point of showing it to us was that if 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 additional density is available and we've now reduced the minimum lot sizes, you might be able to tuck more units in here and there. Yeah. So the thing that I was mostly thinking when I was looking at these, the I, and I think they're all roughly like this: MF one, two, and three. Um, and in terms of land area total land area on the ground, MF1 is definitely the biggest one. The other two are really pretty minor places, but um, it requires more acreage in order to get additional units. And so just in thinking about this, I was like, what's the big deal if on the 7,500 square foot lot, you could put three units? So that's just sort of what caught, sort of had me thinking down this road. But then it's a little bit of a different situation when most of these lots are already built out. Um, because really what it means is that somebody would basically come in again and figure out if they could add more to these existing developments. It's not like you've got you some big vacant lots out there that somebody can come in with a much higher density development. Or somebody lots. could come in and demolish a house. Mm, right. They could, right. or or they could do a, a lot of them could do ADUs and and get away with it without impacting anybody, uh, because some of them, depending on how the house is located on the lot, it might be just fine to do an ADU. Um, for others, maybe not. Um, but it has the potential. I know that there's at the top of. The Briar, I think it is the top of Briar Lane at the top of the hill there. There are some houses that have uh, uh, auxiliary structures, or they look like they're auxiliary structures. Um, 
and it blends in nicely the way the way the houses are built. Um, well, and keep in mind that accessory dwelling units are they're they're not even considered in density. They just are. If you have a single family home, you can have an ADU regardless of you don't need more acreage or land area, square right. feet, I should say, considering these numbers, um, in order to have an ADU anyway. Based on the language in our text at the moment, you need 7,500 square feet for the first dwelling and 5,000 for the next. So you're up to 12,500 to put two structures on. And um, what's that, an eighth of an acre? Yeah. You know, it's pretty. Well, it's almost a quarter of an acre, right? Really. Yeah. So, so the, I guess the math doesn't really. Most of the most of the dwelling units that we just looked at in that map are probably around a quarter acre. Mine's a little bigger. I have to put it in that general neighborhood, and it's about a third of an acre. But you know what? I want to put another structure up, and I probably could. But I don't. Have flat lots of looking at it. You know, that somebody will try it. If, if there's a way that it works and they've got 12,500 square feet, they're entitled to do it. And, you know, we're saying if, if you can show us that it works and you can still meet your setbacks and you can find parking and all the rest of that, then go ahead, right? Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it's a little bit similar to a lot of um, sort of in just thinking about that this is not really the case in this zoning district because this is really intended for more of a multifamily kind of a thing. But, um, you know, a lot of zoning, residential zoning districts do allow for duplexes, but you need more acreage. So it's not like existing neighborhoods really have the opportunity to put a duplex on there because the lot would have to be bigger. So I don't know. I don't. I don't feel a hundred percent strongly about this one way or the other because I. I think it's um, for the reasons you mentioned with the environmental constraints and um, just the fact that it is fairly well built out. I'm. I'm not sure that this is going to make a whole heck of a lot of a difference one way or the other um, if we shift this. But I. I would say it's an opportunity to allow more density. I kind, I kind of agree with John, like if we encourage to get more housing in there and they can do it in a way that meets all the other requirements, then why not if we're encouraging more housing? It seems like the downside could be like a teardown of a townhouse like development that becomes more apartment building like development instead of maybe a more dense townhouse development, which personally to me is nicer than stacked apartment buildings but however but i think encouraging more housing is is my favorite okay so i can edit this just to make it clear that you need 7500 square feet that's it and you can do the uses that's allowed in the zoning district well, I, um, it, I don't see what we, it looks like we said pretty much the same thing three times in that paragraph. It is, right, it is, it's a lot. The existing one's about new and <laughs> the third one's about, but they all say the same thing. They do. 500 square feet for your first dwelling, 5,000 for any subsequent dwelling, whether it's in the same structure or, or not. So you tell me what you're trying to say there. Other than that, I don't know why you need to rewrite anything. Um, so my question to you is whether I remove the extra square footage, the extra 5,000 square feet for additional units. So then you're saying if you have 7,500 square feet at least, you can have What's the limit to density at that point? So in these 500 square feet, can I put a second unit in? Yeah, hold on. Um, let me bring up the 
use table because that will be helpful. Okay, so in those districts, um, you can do uh, all multifamily dwelling. So it's um, single family, duplex, triplex, four, or multifamily. Um, so, you know, the way that the LDC is written now, it's definitely helping to sort of tamper this as you get to. Uh, I see. You know, kind of a. That out. I could keep, I could have, if I had a. 7,500 square foot lot, I can do a single family. And if I don't need any additional square footage for a, the next unit, I could do a four unit structure in the same size lot. Yes, yeah. So there you may get people, you know, let's say they got an old junky house in it and they want to take it down and put a fourplex up. We're saying it's fine. Yeah. Assuming I don't know what the you know how you still got to find room for some number of cars. Right. There's and you still got the lot. I think it's a fifty percent lot coverage. You know, you still have the other limiting factors. That would be a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. And and I don't expect it to actually happen that much, but there will be occasions when it makes sense you know and I, I mean, you can imagine somebody buying buying up let's say houses that are i don't know most of the ones you showed us in that those neighborhoods are pretty well kept up. But some house sort of fell to disrepair and somebody came along and bought it cheap it would make pretty good sense to replace it and, and i'm not saying that would be discouraged except it probably wouldn't it in with the rest of the neighborhood at that point it would be uh you know different so i don't know maybe maybe there needs to be some sliding scale like you know you need you can have two units at the same size but your third one needs that five thousand extra back again or something i don't know what's yeah, i think we uh, we need to be careful we're we're talking about you know, making housing more affordable, making housing more possible, talking about how it's critical for economic development. And and then we talk about, you know, maybe we don't want to let something happen that's going to change the fate of the neighborhood. Well, the neighborhood was designed when we didn't have the issues we have now. And maybe this is reflective of today's uh, world, not yesterday's world. Talking about mm -hmm. MF one or MF yep. two three. Um, hey, do you have an overlay of that, Regina? Because from what I'm seeing on the map, it's I think most of MF one are developments like we see on Brick Yard. Yeah, it's this. And I don't know if you're that saying that. And Autumn Way. Yep. Uh, Autumn Pond Way down on the end of Camp Street there. So and they're existing. This... I think what are generally townhome developments yeah they're, they're kind not of historically uh single family or multi-family homes right really all of them that i looked at are similar situation to that even this this parcel down here too and i think this one also um yeah. and to me in favor those were designed you know they have a traffic car heavy design um mm -hmm. not designed for you know urban living and yeah if, if we can encourage a little bit higher density um i'm all for that i under i see john's point and i think where some of that might come into play also is the mf3 but i don't know if we're talking about that at all yeah i don't my opinion for mf3 is very hard because it's a totally different kind of scenario just yeah right. um so we might just want to leave mf three as is mf2 i think is kind of almost sort of a not well mf2 is actually in the same boat i think there are similar type developments on those two random parcels um it even has mf i'm if i'm reading this correctly mf2 is also on west street and that big string yeah that's in that green yeah um there 
Boy, um, I wouldn't even know that was MF2, although I did take a, a bike ride by there, and there's a lot of duplexes in there, and they're nicely placed, um, which is why I don't think of it as being that highly residential, but it is. It, they, whoever put those duplexes on there, put them on that they don't, unless you just start looking, you don't really recognize it unless you do a slow crawl past. Uh, if you're just driving by a car, you wouldn't really know. You think I'm just another house. So. Yeah, and there, you know, it's it's pretty limited there. Those lots are narrow. The state owns the land behind it. There's not going to be a. That's not likely a place that's going to transition. No, uh, people, people enjoy having the nice park behind them. I guess I find with with that uh, modification in MF one and MF. Okay, so um, it's going to be a bigger lift for somebody because the you know you're not talking about taking down one you know, several thousand square foot building. You're talking about taking down something much more substantial or rebuilding after a fire. Or something. So, but you know, I think those are opportunities to consider increasing density. Uh, to to do the, the rebuild there on Park Street. Uh, you know, we never saw that. I, I don't know why, how that even happened. I don't know how that happened, happened. but anyhow, but <laughs> it, it, it's it's three or four units yeah. on, on what the, I'm not sure what would be, had been there, but yeah, it's three or four units. Yeah. If it got rebuilt on the same foundation, shouldn't we still have seen it? I never saw it come through. It never came through. Okay, so now that we made that decision, um, uh, I'll just, what was that? Now we're flying. Now we're flying. Um, so, um, my, as we talked about a bunch of times, my original intent is to not force things to go to PUD approval unless they really need to be. Um, just given what we just changed and knowing what's on the ground today, are you folks comfortable that these approvals would potentially not have to go down a PUD approval route? Or would you just feel comfortable considering um, the, the sort of real transition that this might be that you'd like to see it continue to go to PUD? Uh, I, I would hope that the language that we use to describe when and how the PUD could or must be used would still be sufficient to govern whatever might happen here. Okay, because right now, notice I'm suggesting deleting this last sentence, which is the sentence that really does require multifamily projects in this zoning district to go to PUD approval. Um, so your LDCs right now say, you can't do more than one single family home on a lot without getting PUD approval. Um, does it really say that? Does it, doesn't it say you, you have to, you, you may bring it to the, well, the, if you want relief from some, some of the criteria? The PUD section says that, but this particular zoning district with this sentence that I pulled out of here, let me unpull it out. I've seen it there. Oh no, I just hit reject all changes. Oh no. Undo. Oh, thank you. Control Z. Uh, okay, reject. It's not letting me reject this one change. Um, so this says one single family home is allowed per lot unless reviewed as a planned unit development. Which is a weird thing to say in a multi-family district or a multi. Right. Yeah. I'm fine with you striking that. It doesn't seem like it belongs there. Anyway. Okay. Sounds good to me. Um, 
Okay, and then similarly, it had this whole PUD section that we've edited a few times now for the other zoning districts, and I'm, I'm making the same changes here. Um, okay, very good. Um, so we don't need to beat on these two. We just basically talked through all of these, MF2 and MF3. Um, village center. Um, so just made some of those minor changes you asked for last time to make sure the actual um, URLs to the map two in the comprehensive plan and the design five corners plan is actually referenced in here. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Talked about that previously. Okay. So at the last meeting, we talked about this quite a bit, sort of we're trying to step up the site features and the um, design to promote cycling, walking and transit. Um, so we are requiring folks to have at least two of these amenities. Talked about how really the first one should happen everywhere. Um, the last two just might not be possible given the, given the context in some places. Um, and I added in sort of public art murals and interactive games. And then I put in some images. Um, these images are provided as illustrations of intent. They are not like you must do these things. They are just for reference. Um, did these work for folks? Did this make sense? Yeah, I might have a picture of a bike path or some kind of a pedestrian walkway that wasn't obviously a city sign. Yeah, I mean, I so what we're talking about here is the, well, I was thinking about it in my mind as really in the front, what's facing the public street and how you really do your development in a, in a way that, um, really uh, creates the frontage that you really want to see. So that's why I only have photos here. But it's a good question. And I didn't really word this well, to address like a bike path that would maybe be off the back of the property or something. Yeah, well, we're, we're still working on connectivity and that's more than just the sidewalks in front that could be any right I, I think you know I, part of what we've been trying to say is that is that when you do a, one of these PUDs we're trying to end up with something and you know that's a little better or higher design and and it it would be nice if it was available to the public at large but I, I think the question that you're asking is does it really have to be you know, if you're putting in a playground that's uh, for the residents of the development, that's equally beneficial to what we're trying to do here. And it may or may not be available to the public at large, right? But the concept is you wouldn't actually get that or the open space or the protection of other features on the site without the trade-off for density. So, right. That, like in theory, that's mostly how it works. Order or uh, you know, grouped housing or some of those other benefits possibly benefit everyone beyond the residents of the development, depending on where they're located and, and how, how things play out. But uh, I, I think what we're saying is it, it may not be strictly required that they be or accessible to or used by the general public. Oh, there, yeah. there are bike paths, walking paths from connectivity to Forest Road from your neck of the woods. Yeah, oh, those are and, great. Those you know, great. there's the, you know, there's the, the bike walk path that's on Brickyard. And, so, like, and, I guess my point is, can you essentially legislate public use of something? And I, I know what the answer would like to be yes, but. Well, I think we encouraged the developer to uh, continue the connectivity, let's say on the, from the village to Forest Road, 
because it was already there and we encouraged them to continue that connectivity. So uh, do we have that in there, connectivity between neighborhoods? Could that be one of the, um, the items? I mean, that's, that is a great... Because I know, um, like, um, no, it's not Kimberly Drive. It's, oh gosh, where is the name of it? I'm not sure what that one is. The end of um, Grandview, there is a cut through between, Grand, you can't walk or bike, but you can't take a car. You can walk between the two developments over to Suffolk Road or whatever it is. Um, and so that's there. There are some connectivity pieces um, that were not this, well, they, I guess they were encouraged. Like, um, well, like that's the why one, they still exist. The one at Village Walk in my neighborhood connects yeah. two neighborhoods that were historically always connected by uh, what do they call them? Uh, Primitive trails. Yes, primitive trails. And, mm. and they were formalized, and they're used every day by people on, in both neighborhoods. But it gets you from a public street to another public street, so uh, at, on what appears to be a public pathway. So, so it's a great example of what we're trying to achieve here, which is yeah, connectivity that does have a public use aspect to it that happens in a PUD. And benefits more than just the local residents, right? So that somehow that should be on our list of. Um, I mean the the trail that goes in uh, beach, beach, the end goes up and along in there. They eventually goes up into the town. Ten, if you keep taking it, you can go all the way to Hannaford's. Um, I mean people walk up there regularly on that that trail. Um, to go to the store, which is up yeah. the street. Regina, can you explain item A on the list there? Pedestrian access directly from the building to the public sidewalk. Won't that yeah. be, by definition, be there anyway? I mean, that that's actually a fire requirement for any act, exit from any building and has to actually get to a public way. So I'm not really saying that wants to be part of a PUD bonus. So just to clarify, we're in the village center district standards right now. Okay. These additions that we made, we wanted to put in here just for across the board, any application that you would get not associated with PUD. Okay, that makes a lot of big difference. Yeah. And we, it is confusing because we ended up doing a similar thing in the over the new overlay but then also tried to sort of beef this up in the PUD part too. But this is right now, we're just looking at the village center standards. Um, so yeah, that's a great question, John. I This statement, I was just sort of trying to get away from a situation where you might have a new, and maybe this wouldn't happen, but like a new strip mall type of project where you're really, the majority of the access is from the parking behind it. And you'd really, don't put an actual real pedestrian entrance on the public facing side of the building. Yeah, I'm hoping we don't end up with a strip mall in the village center, but um, the, I see what you're getting at. It is slightly different, uh, a group of uh, possible incentive components than, than would be in the overall PUD section. Yeah. If this was added to address the issue, like with the McGillicuddy building, that you have to access it from the you know, clear access from the street, we talk about kind of that issue. So that might have been why this was looked at at some point. Raj's question. Um, yeah, Raj had a question in the chat there. There's actually four things in the chat now. I don't know uh, what they all are, but. Maybe you can browse through them and let us know. Uh, set, Raj's recent question was, how, is the, uh, what are the setbacks um, in the village center? And I think there's zero. Yeah. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. Zero setback requirement in the village center. Um, okay. So, 
Also, sorry, you might need to change that approval from the planning commission. Oh, yes, thank sorry. you. I didn't do that at all in chapter six yet. Um, so I will get get in there. Um, yeah, I guess the village center is going to become the city center. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's certain place. Yeah. Uh, Raj, the reason there are no uh, setbacks required in the village center is that tension is to create a much denser, much more urban type development pattern. And uh, so the way that happens is uh, by eliminating things like uh, setbacks, although there are, also, there are some uh, what uh, definitions of that. You still need sidewalks, you still need public ways, you still need parking, you, you still need some other things that end up giving you some separations and some access points and some setback from the street. But uh, setbacks from the property line or setbacks from adjacent structures could be zero. Uh, we haven't seen that much of that. Uh, we haven't because because the businesses have asked and and we yeah. and Robin's been very good at negotiating uh, those setbacks to have uh, places sit in front of businesses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, it's a negotiated agreement to get the project to have the amenities out front um, so far. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, for Pearl Street gave us 15 feet of their property on Pearl and Park. 11 um, Park gives 12 feet of their property. The old Domino's building, they'd given us 10 feet. It wasn't built. Uh, the other side of the road, uh, the building hasn't gone up yet where the old um, laundromat is. They said they needed to have the upper uh, floors of their building to their property line, but they said they'd give us an arcade down below so people could walk undercover. But we got to remember that some of the lots in the village center district are small. Can I ask a question? Um, I'm finally I'm really able to speak as opposed to text. Sorry, I was busy with <laughs> Thing. Sorry, I was trying to stop that happening, but go ahead, Rash. <laughs> I know, I know, and I, I respect that. <laughs> I, I understand completely. Um, <laughs> it's just it's just a curiosity, and when, please don't feel like we need to go to, too far down the road right now. We'll talk about this later, I'm sure. But um, if we're trying to get people to do what's pictured and do what I see in, in so many of our larger planning documents and conceptual planning documents, and there's no requirement for any kind of distance from the street, which is kind of what I'm thinking. So if I'm thinking the wrong thing, please just tell me and I'll shut up. But if, if there's no requirement for it um, and somebody can build right up to the, right up to the curb. No, not the curb. That's a, there's a difference between building to the street and building, having a setback from your property line because the village actually, the city actually owns uh, a right of way that's designated has nothing to do with the property lines necessarily so usually dependent on the level of service the road has and so on so there you aren't going to have anybody that can build right up to the curb uh, there's lots of reasons why not but uh, that is kind of a so, discussion i want to really move through our our ldc here if we can and, and we can um we can have a a session where we go through all the setbacks and other things that are in and what it really means based on, uh, I mean, maybe Robin can provide us some mapping and stuff, but uh, Sounds great. you aren't going to have anybody that can actually put a building right on the edge of the curve. Like in Burlington, for example, there are no setbacks down there either, and, and they have a 12 foot minimum from face of curb to face of building, so uh, that's something. So, so Raj, the, the only place we really have zero setbacks are in some of the uh, brown L block that there's uh, at best six inches, I think, <coughs> buildings. So they, they literally have done the zero lot line in between these buildings. Um, so the, at the moment, there are those. That's the only place you're going to find zero lot line. Wow. 
Alright, uh, Regina, you stopped, um, yes. screen. does that mean we're, we're through with that section and you're loading up another? Uh, I am just scrolling down through the document to the next section. So if folks are, um, good with Village Center District for now, um, the next, uh, zoning district I want to talk about, and these are, we're nearing the end here of chapter six, is R1 and R2. Um, so again, these, um, a couple of things. So last time with the joint meeting, uh, with the trustees, uh, we had the planning commission had already previously talked about duplexes being fine in R1 and R2. So that has been, um, added to the land use table. And then there was a a suggestion about why not triplexes in these as well. So we want to just have a discussion about that. Um, and again, these zoning districts do require the planned unit development review if there's going to be more than one principal structure on a lot. So again, that starts to get tricky. You can't really do a duplex or a triplex without going through a um, planned unit development process as if it were a subdivision, which most people wouldn't do that as a subdivision. So I'm suggesting that we take that out. Then also after that meeting, I talked with Terry and she just pointed out that um, one of the limiting factors, well, two of the limiting factors for um, allowing some infill in the R1 and R2 residential zoning districts is the lot coverage and the parking requirements. So um, right now you require two parking spaces per unit. Um, and if you're gonna try to do more on the lot, um, a lot coverage of currently you have 40%, that could be a little bit tight. And the building coverage of currently you have 25% building coverage that could be a little bit tight too if you're trying to realistically do a duplex or a triplex. So, Sorry. yeah, no, I, that's it. Just those are the sort of issues to sort of think through. Well, I just want to ask the PC uh, to take a look at the design five corners uh, post I put up about two or three days ago. I know most of them look at it over breakfast. Maybe some have missed it, but uh, it talks about the costs of parking and the cost of parking in relation to housing and the costs of parking in relation to affordable housing. Um, I can't remember offhand now, some estimates were $60,000 per car for garage space, $30,000 per car for surface space. And a lot of municipalities are looking at reducing uh, the number of parking spaces required as a way to increase the potential for affordable housing. It also takes up a lot of land area too. Yeah, and that, maybe, sorry. Um, just gonna say that those suggestions, I didn't get a chance to put in your email, but I do have some of that information for you tonight. Um, if, you, if you'd like me to bring that up about what the other municipalities are doing and the suggestion for parking reductions. I'm all in favor of parking requirements. I can't really hear you, Phil. I don't know if that's my own problem or everybody's having that problem. I can. Phil's problem. Let me try and fix it. Um, so, would it help if I bring up some of that parking stuff now, or do we want to stick with the zoning districts right now? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, just let's stick with the zoning districts. Sorry, Richard. No, it's okay. It's all tied together. So it's hard to, you know, get to a 100% pathway without, it's all related. Is this better? Yes, way better. I had to disconnect and reconnect again. I was just saying that I'm all in favor of reducing parking requirements, that I think most of them are antiquated and take cars too much into consideration over actual people. I was just wondering, Regina, if you could explain the principal structure issue because I my understanding is the definition of duplex and triplex is three or two units all in one structure so oh 
Yep. Yeah, I would. I, yeah. I'll go with that. If that, um, that's an oversight on my part. If that's the case, if that's the case, then. And we're all good. That's it's interesting because the multifamily talks about it as single family. So you're right. This is using a different phrase. It's using principal structure. Um, I will check that if that's true. Well, there was a, I noticed that the language in the, the multifamily one that we were reviewing also had principal structure and how many units were in the principal structure. And I, it was, you know, I kept wanting to see one of those three options that we kind of joked about, you know, maybe there was a principal structure and an accessory structure um, rather than having one primary structure. So I'm guessing they're imagining a house with a breezeway and a garage and somehow that turns into a primary structure with an accessory structure. Or maybe it's an existing garage that doesn't have a breezeway connection, but now we have sort of two structures on one site. But I think we want to be um, careful to make sure that language is accurate because, um, you know, if you have a principal structure that's one thing, as soon as you add a, another unit to that, it's a duplex. If you add an accessory dwelling unit to it, it could mm -hmm. take a number of forms, but it's usually in a garage or an attached. But it doesn't necessarily have to be attached. You know, so then you would have two structures on one site. Well, it actually does have to be attached. Um, and it we've have has to be attached. Yes, we have actually. What people have done is put up a trellis. It just says attached. It doesn't say R. Sometimes people put up a, a, a trellis to attach the garage to the house. You can see it on Pleasant Street. Here's one example I can think of. There's your yeah. breezeway. Yeah. Well, it's not even a breezeway. <laughs> no. A breezy. Breezy. It's a very yeah. breezy. breezy. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. It looks like we have a definition for duplex that you can look at later, Regina. I can't find triplex, though, so we may need to add that. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so I would say a duplex has to be two units in the same structure. And the same for a triplex, I would say three units in one structure. Right. Um, okay, so I'll look at that. So, um, bigger picture. Yeah. Sense of, we're already good with duplexes here. Are you okay with triplexes here? R1. We got thumbs up from Patrick and Phil. Well, I, I just keep going back to the map that shows yeah. where R1s and R2s Oh, yeah. Are. Sorry. I can uh, realize that. One is what you kind of showed us before on. Fairly open, large lots. Yeah. Um, Mostly all up here. Yeah. Okay. So what what's misleading in this map is the school properties. Right. That, um, they're not. They may be R one on this map, but they're really school properties. I think we need to refine this map to define the school properties because I really doubt that we're going to build houses on those. And um, although the CT is, is, is building Taft Street as we speak, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I think yeah. we need to change our coloration on, on that school properties so that they aren't R1s. Well, they should be broken out so we know what they are. Right. Well, yeah, I'm not sure how much it matters on, yeah. I mean, you don't have a public use zoning district i mean we could create one but I'm well i i think they're you know they're owned by the school district unless the school right. district sells yeah them, then, right uh, well they do everything they would never years. turn over and you never build anything on it. well the, the ct has has built taft street in upper drury um yeah, but those are already lots that are created 
Well, as right. you can see, well, they, yeah, they, yes, they the lots. More and then they build the house. They're, they're not, not all built on yet. They just, no, there's yeah. there's like six that are to go. Um, all right. So uh, the question is, do we want duplexes or triplexes in there? And what's the downside of that? Downside of a triplex? If done well, but it, there isn't a downside. <coughs> uh, if it's done well, it might look like a Victorian. Um, if it's done well. If well, that's what I said. If so it's done well. That, that <laughs> park again. I think the biggest issue is you got you know, what looks like a single family house, but now you got ten cars out there. That's when things start to go south. Right. So well, how does the park do we, I think we need to talk about the parking. Well, what's what's yeah. the parking situation in the developments that are one right now? I mean, you've got uh, typically two car garages and typically um, enough room to get four or five cars on, you know, the driveway plus the in the garage. So, um, you know, the so, normal cycle is why while, while there are kids at home, there are lots right. of cars and then they disappear and yeah. then there's not lots of cars um so uh the thinking is um here's what you currently are requiring um in essex junction for single family and duplexes two parking spaces per dwelling unit uh for multifamily, you're also requiring two spaces per multifamily dwelling unit doesn't call out smaller units um plus one space for every 10. So that's fairly typical. There's a visitor parking requirement essentially. And then for ADUs, uh, one space per ADU. Um, so other, this is just sort of what other folks are doing. I would say Essex has not really had this conversation yet um, in terms of sort of newer thinking around parking requirements. And they already require a lot, 2.3 spaces per dwelling unit for single family and duplex. Um, but then they do require a little bit less for the multifamily. Um, Burlington. So now when we get into Burlington, South Burlington and Williston, um, these folks have been putting a little bit more thought into the concepts of um, either reducing the minimum requirements of parking that we all have traditionally used for decades and decades, um, or uh, just removing parking requirements, period. Folks who are gonna come in with developments are very likely to ensure that there's going to be parking on the lot that they feel confident they need in order to fill those units. Then there's a third tier of thinking about this. It is setting a maximum number of parking spaces that can be allowed. Um, and that um, really is probably pushing the envelope the furthest, uh, but really in places where you're um, have a lot of other opportunity. You have some lot more shared parking spaces. You can you have a lot more on street parking. Um, you can kind of get to a point where uh, you want to prohibit a new housing developer from putting in additional parking into your village or your downtown. Um, and definitely. Geographically, the thinking is a little bit different on this between whether you're in a residential neighborhood or more of a mixed use downtown kind of place. So um, Burlington, as an example, they have set up the entire city into three distinct areas. Um, let me just show you that map real quick. Sorry for the scrolling. Um, so here's Burlington. They have a neighborhood district and again these are these phrases are only for their parking standards so they've kind of like stuck a bunch of different things together um so the neighborhood then they have two it's hard to see them in here but there's two different multifamily mixed use districts and then there's the purple is a shared use district so they don't have an urban center district I, they're mostly calling that the mixed use 
Um, so four single family and duplexes in Burlington in that multi, in that mixed use, really the downtown places, um, no minimum parking requirement. And they have a maximum on it, um, which is 100% of the minimum, which I need to confirm this with Megan, but in theory, they're not letting anybody build more parking down there. I don't think that's true. So I, I don't think this quite works out, but then if you think about the shared use districts and those neighborhood districts, they're still keeping two spaces per dwelling unit as a minimum um, in for single family and duplexes. And then they have set a maximum based on, uh, in the 100%, it basically equates to that minimum. Um, so in theory, if we did single family dwelling unit, duplex and triplex, the, the single family in, in R1, and R2 would be two cars. You have to have space for two cars. If you have a duplex, you have to have space for four cars. And if you have a triplex, you have to have space for six. Yeah. It, the, 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 the drawback for me would be the triplex that needs to park nine or 10 cars. And yeah. it happens. Then, then you get into how many bedrooms and how many related adults and whatever. But um, you know, if somebody decides they're trying to um, rent out a bedroom, or you get a third car, what, whatever. Right? There, there are ways that this can you can generate a lot of cars in a hurry if your situation arises. So, um, I, I right, and I think that's where the max comes in. Yeah. So there wouldn't be more than two per unit. Yeah, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, I think we have a restriction on the maximum width of our driveways at the street, which is 20 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are plenty of people that have paved a third lane in their driveway, you know, usually for an accessory, uh, you know, like a motorhome or a boat or something. Or an extra car uh, so that the garage can still, um, you know, support normal traffic so you know really it, it's uh if, if we're hoping people just aren't using their car that much that's great but most of the r1 district is is only walkable by certain people and you know i'll tell you from experience that most of the parents are driving their kids to school and now even to the bus stop which might only be 200 yards away and you know it's not what we think is expected behavior but it's happening yeah so um it it's not as walkable a neighborhood as let's say the r2 or or the things closer to the village center where you know you're in a more compact environment and you're taking advantage of it and everybody kind of gets it. you know our the r1 neighborhood here is is just a little more suburban and so you're going to see more cars so uh, I'm all in favor of not not necessarily requiring that you have all those spaces, but somehow we need to plan accordingly. Like you know how how is that? Let's say you have a triplex. <coughs> how is it going to be used? Right? How much land do you have? And are we going to let you pave it or park on the grass? Because that that's what'll happen. Well, depending on which residential area you are in, it's like, you know, you've only got a maximum of 40% coverage. You used to be 25% coverage. So now that, you can that's, pay more of it. Uh, yes, now you can pay more of it. Um, or you don't. You just put a car on it and it's a packed dirt spot. Um, I don't know if we, don't we not allow that? You can't we don't allow that, grass. but we have a lot of that occurring. Um, so... You know, especially in the winter time. Um, especially right. So the... winter, I mean, a lot of us have street. I mean, you could park on the street most of the year, and it's that's not terrible. But winter time comes along from January. It, it's December first, December to April first. Yes. Uh, you know, you get ticketed for having your car on the street, even if there's no street. 
no snow in the forecast for a month, you're still going to get a ticket. Okay. So no on-street parking in the winter. Yeah. So okay. so where are we where are we at with this conversation? We yeah. I feel like we're kind of going in circles a little bit. I don't want to cater to the um to the household that drives their kid to the bus stop two houses down. I don't think we need to be factoring that into our conversation. So so can I just keep explaining what what the other towns have done that have put a lot of thought into this? Um, so South Burlington and Williston, they both have landed in a place with single family and duplexes where they are not setting a minimum parking requirement nor a maximum parking requirement. Um, they don't wanna set a maximum because they don't wanna end up in a place where they're um, saying somebody's out of compliance if they technically have a space in their garage and a space in front of their garage because people don't always use their garages that way. Um, and minimum is just really behind the whole sort of um, concept that uh, folks are gonna build what they feel like they need to build in terms of parking. There's really no reason from a regulatory requirement to require a minimum amount of parking for these uses. So they're definitely took it to another level than what Burlington did. Um, and then uh, also in South Burlington, they've done a lot of sort of active research on what parking is happening in their multifamily projects, uh, particularly behind Shaw's, um, because those developments have been there for quite a while. And they really adjusted their multifamily parking requirements based on what they were really seeing people do there. Um, so then it's sort of, they start getting into sort of the nitty gritty of how many bedrooms you're having in those units and therefore you're building the parking minimum requirements off of that. Um, Winooski uh, didn't really adjust, when they did their form based code, they didn't really adjust the parking minimums. They, it was sort of on the to-do list to come back to that. And so I know they're still sort of talking about it, but I don't think they've made changes as far as I'm aware of. So just so you know where everybody's at on the on this concept. Um, then lastly, I'll say the zoning for great neighborhoods um, document that the state put out that the uh, Congress for new urbanism helped with. Um, their basic concept is if you really feel like you need to require a minimum, it should be one space per unit. Um, and if you feel comfortable enough getting away from requiring it just stop requiring a certain amount. Um, and then really you can kind of use the maximum if you really feel like you're in a place where uh, you have a lot of other par parking options for people. I, th I think the maximum is tricky if you don't have other public options for people. So uh, what would uh, everybody think of not having any requirements, but maybe keeping a tighter rein on the total lot coverage. What you're really ending up with is a ratio between pavement and built environment and green space. And so if you've got enough land, you can put more cars on it. It won't seem that out of place, but we're not letting you pave. You know, I would go up to 40% coverage and stay maybe just what, go up to 30 or 35 or something, but not yeah. giving them a, a number for the cars. I think a lot of developers, John, as you might know, come in, whatever project they're doing, whatever square footage they're building, they know the number of parking spaces they need to attract commercial tenants. I know we're talking about residential here, but uh, they know what they need to make their project work. They've done it before, they know. And um, it would be very, in fact, you know, for one of the projects, I'll not name it. I was told that there were too few parking spaces that the, um, the commercial units would not rent because the people who wanted to move in would say there's not enough parking close by. Right. So does anybody feel like we need to say one? Well, let's take, for example, the, the, the multi-unit development that just went in on Maple Street, or it's going in now. If you did not have a requirement 
and they only put one space per unit in there, well, they wouldn't have to do that either. If they didn't have to put the parking on there, they could have possibly gotten one more unit in there. But the reality is, is would they have, would someone have bought or rented there without at least having one space per unit? Right. Which is what right. the developer's going to reckon. It's gonna, they're going to need one space, at least one space per unit. Yeah, the, the developer, in order to market that space, <clears throat> they know what they're who they're trying to rent it to and if they decide to choose zero parking spaces i mean it's unfortunate and none of us would want any of those housing units to remain vacant but that might be the case and the risk that the developers putting themselves in so are we willing to let somebody eat a tent then feels like at least one space per unit would be i think in the in the uh r1 R2 areas, like when we're talking duplexes and triplexes, I'm not sure I'm comfortable saying no requirements, but I'm also not comfortable saying six parking spots for a triplex. Also, I think that's excessive. So finding a balance to me is preferable. Is one space per unit a balance? I, yeah, I could, I could go for one space per unit. I, I think one, at least one one space per unit. Um, and maybe four for a triplex. I mean, you know, there's no visitors. There's no, you know, like. Well, there could be visitors. Well, I, mean, I mean, also when we're when we're talking R two and R one, we've we're kind of talking about divvying up the city the same way Burlington did, where mm -hmm. you could have different requirements in both of those. We are saying that R one is a bit more further out, less connected to the main trunk roads, less, you know, so we could, we could add an additional requirement there if we wanted to. Does somebody have a pin to bedrooms? I think a couple did. So what if you did uh, one space per unit up to one and two bedrooms and Two space, well, not one space for visitor for three bedrooms or more. So if you still had, you, you, the most you'd be asking for would be two spaces under the assumption that if you had a four bedroom house, you might need an extra space. You could do that for um, two family and three family could be one space plus one visitor. So you'd still only want them to have at least two spaces mm -hmm. and be done. Uh, Raj looks like he has his hand up. I don't know if that's been up for a while or. For a minute, if that's all right. I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about, Diane knows this well. I'm thinking about my neighborhood and some of the neighborhoods I ride my bike through in the town. And I know we're talking about sort of new build. So this might not apply, but. You know, the village city has a big problem with with people parking wherever they feel like they can in their yard. And we don't enforce anything. You know, I'm speaking as a resident right now. The trustees don't enforce a darn thing. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we've got two houses on Edgewood alone with a total of 12 cars in their yards that are unregistered and have been that way for over 10 years. So, you know, if... We we gotta we gotta find a balance between especially with duplexes and triplexes because you're just gonna end up with what was said earlier with with what is supposed to be green space ending up being dirt with cars on it 365 days a year. Well, um, we look at that as an enforcement problem and not a planning problem. So yeah, problem I think you know I think if we're gonna let let it be built though and this is just my opinion but if we're gonna let it be built knowing that we're not going to enforce it or knowing that it's an, a problem that the community is going to have a hard time affording to enforce. Let me put it that way, because we're not going to set aside $200,000 a year or more to enforce issues like this. And that's kind of what it would cost. Um, I'm sure if you towed some of those cars out of there, you'd get some attention. But, uh, yeah, you still got to. I know you haven't been doing it and that's, that's fine, but the planning 
the planning of this wants to be sensitive to people not having as many cars or not having as big cars or not. And that's not to say it, it isn't going to happen, but um, there there's a huge effort, especially in our apartment complexes and not single family neighborhoods, but uh, it's been pretty much shown that that one or two cars would be the maximum you'd ever need. And, and the average of a one or two bedroom apartment unit is still around one and a half to 1.6 cars per unit. Unless it's, unless it's a rental. <clears throat> and I, I think the apartment building thing is completely different than, I mean, you're talking about the residential areas where there are yards, you know? Um, so I'm just, I, all I'm saying is do, do set something. Um, on, and, and I'm, I'm coming from a place where I'd assume we have less cars in the village. I just don't realistically, I just don't see how you do that. Um, especially for triplexes and duplexes. Um, we've got single family homes that are two or three bedrooms with six and eight people in them, you know, and, and six or eight cars in the front yard and on the street. Well, and it, it really brings, it, it really impacts the neighborhood, you know, and, and for, for sure, Raj, and I hear what you're saying, but I, I, at that same point, the, my reaction to that is like, we could set for a, a housing unit, a, a duplex that has two dwelling units and say we set a maximum of 1.5 per dwelling unit. Mm. So that duplex would get three parking spaces in total for those two dwelling units to yes. share. Totally respect that. I'm just, I'm just saying, and, and if they like one per. Yeah, and yeah. if eight people are living there and there are eight cars, that's still like we can't plan for that. So I mean, it's still it still may happen. It still might not happen. Um, yeah, I guess it's an enforcement thing. I'll, I'll shut up. Uh, we we got to do. I, I mean, it's a it's a it's a valid time. valid. I mean, point, I guess though. I'm curious what other communities, how other communities are dealing with it. Um, and I guess that's not so much. I you know from what I just listened to, it it sounds like they've they are somehow um just don't know how and that's a that's a conversation for a different I mean, time my question right now is uh around if somebody could explain to me maybe a little bit more about like lot coverage when it comes to uh, the residential single family and duplex like r1 r2 as we've been discussing if you're only allowed to develop a certain percentage of the lot and does that include the housing unit and the parking is considered lot coverage anything that's not drainable uh, basically yeah. so, pathways sheds yeah. anything so Next. if somebody comes in with Adios. a lot size and they decide that they want to push the envelope to 40 percent coverage and they want to put a single housing unit and that has you know maybe it's a duplex and it only encompasses 20% of the lot coverage and they want to take the remaining 20% and make it out to be however many parking spaces fit within that 20%, who are we to stop them? They're still hitting that 40% lot coverage maximum. Right. Right. Um, and I'll just say that the issue of unregistered cars is a def is definitely a different issue, and that would typically be addressed via ordinance as opposed to the zoning regulations. But um, but you're, you're right, Patrick. Without a maximum parking requirement, which again is sort of a new new world, um, I don't think that there's anything that uh, that is on the books that could prevent that. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in my personal, I'm all for reducing the number of parking spots. I'd love to see car, you know, we should be building our, uh, our communities more for the pedestrian, more for the person and not for the cars like we have historically um, across the entire country. Uh, but we could in some ways address this parking issue by we have lot coverage, you know, within all of these areas. Um, it's not ideal for somebody to pave 40% of their lot and put in a parking lot. But I mean, we have the regulations that allows the remaining 60% to be open space and trees and shrubs and, you know, whatever else. And uh, I'll also point out there's setbacks and other things that are still applicable, um, you know, fairly enforceable for at least the, yeah. the dwelling units. So, I mean, so I'm looking at kind of South Burlington right there in the middle is like it, 
I understand, I understand that there could be a slippery slope, I suppose, with some of that no set minimum and no maximum, but we do have lot coverage requirements. And yeah, so. And I guess as we learned too from, uh, who was it, Chelsea, as you described the impervious services, once you park a car on your side yard for however many of years and that becomes uh, compacted earth, that is now an impervious surface. And should we then be considering that lot coverage because it starts to fall within that impervious surface definition? But that, that's, a, that's opening up uh, an, another conversation, I think. Yeah, but that's a good question. And we could just sort of look at the lot coverage definition to see if it, um, to see if it addresses that. That would be a difficult one. You know, how many years does it have to be? How can we prove many years it's been? Right. Sounds like it's, uh, it's uh, just something that's going to go to court. Um, All right. So we either need to come up with a minimum number or we need to come up with no number and just let the lot coverage govern. And then someone would have to enforce that because otherwise it could be taken advantage. So I think I'm... Personally, I'd, I'd like to see some way to acknowledge what happens with a duplex or a triplex, but not necessarily require them to build two per unit. So uh, I can't imagine any dwelling unit not needing at least one per dwelling unit. Fair, yeah. Time. So I guess I would, I would go with the recommended column at on one space and then make sure that we um, have lot coverages that would restrict the this parking lots supporting you know multi-unit and i don't know 40 40 percent you know it's, that's generally pretty high it's more common in commercial districts than residential well, that's what the suggestion here is for, for R1 is is 50% lot coverage and and the building is no more than, than 40%. Yeah, I think that's too much. Yeah, I think I think it's probably a good strategy as sort of a first step is to reduce the parking space requirement and then maybe leave, like you're saying, leave the lot coverage as it is today. So for R1, that would be max lot coverage of 40 percent 40 percent and 25 for for the buildings for the building and that one i still wonder a little bit like if you actually wanted to get a duplex on there could you at 25 percent probably not could, could you do it with 35 instead well let, maybe maybe there's wiggle room in the building versus parking lot coverage but still no more than 40 what is it, 40? 40. Yeah. So maybe we go the maximum total. And I just checked R2 is the same. So for both R1 and R2, sorry, let me start. Let me share this. Um, okay. So uh, let me see if I can just reject this. We're going to go back to 40% total lot coverage. And maybe we bump it up from 25% to 30% for the building coverage. Right, so if you go 30%, you still have to show us how you got your parking unit, but we reduce the number of parking spaces that you're required to have. Yeah. Um, all right. Any, uh, any, do we need to, do we have a consensus on, on that for R1? When you said R2 is similar? Yes. R2 is the same building coverage and lot coverage. So I'm looking at the R2 district and seeing that a lot of the lots are, well, there, there are quite a few of the lots percentage wise that are smaller than the R1 lots and are don't know exactly what that means, but it's going to put more pressure on them to 
be able to pull off the number of parking spaces in a building in a, a smaller lot coverage, right? I mean, the lots are smaller. Well, yeah. A lot of those, lot of those lots are a third of an acre. Uh, a lot of them are. A lot of them are. At, at max, they, they, max. They, they they're, look smaller. They're, it's, some of them are a sixth of an acre. Yeah. Okay. So. The, the bigger corner ones are a third. Ones in the rows are a six. All right. So we're saying the same thing, though. That That's going to limit them. So the, the smaller lots really can't do what the bigger lots can do, which is kind of what we're hoping for anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, everybody okay with this at the moment? Patrick, you all right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's going to... Pretty, pretty major proposal for a... It's in years. So. Uh, Bill, good? Yeah, I think that... I think this idea will incentive incentivize duplexes to go where duplexes work and triplexes to go where triplexes work, which I think is our intent, for sure. Awesome. Right, yeah. trying trying not to squeeze a triplex onto a sixth of an acre and uh, and provide seven parking spots on that same sixth of an acre with three dwelling units it just won't work. Yeah, from parking. All right, good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, it's, uh, late. After eight, and I think we probably have about fifteen minutes left in us before. Okay. Um. Yeah. Are we sufficiently down with this one? The six, six, six twenty-two. So, just one other change that I made in these two, or I'm suggested changing. Um, and again, I don't feel that strongly about this. I I can back out of these changes, but um, I really just am trying to avoid situations where you're making a decision based on the character of the neighborhood um, because it's really subjective and there is likely going to be some um, evolution over time. And so it's just not great precedent to make decisions based on that. And so this section specifically is talking about the front setback. So what? Front setback. Okay. So um, for the most part, the front setback, um, the minimum front setback shall be 20 feet. But the way that your regulations are written, which is good, is you can sort of look at what's going on in your neighborhood and the two lots next to you. And if you average those together, and let's say they're closer, you could potentially get closer based on the average of what's next to you. So there's some, some good flexibility in there, I think. It's um, pretty common and I like it. So, uh, you know, it's made, it makes, it keeps the street relatively normal when you apply that. So, <clears> you can <throat> see any downside to that. Yeah. So, then both in R1 and R2, the LDC goes further to say um, the Planning Commission can then waive this altogether. So, if there's a challenge meeting those setback requirements, um, the, well, it used to read, the planning commission could waive those requirements um, if the proposed setback does not negatively impact the character of the neighborhood. That's what I'm suggesting you take out just because how you're gonna make that decision. Um, and then, uh, and the proposed setback would be in keeping with the, setbacks or character again of the anticipated future development of the area so i'm just suggested that you do keep this flexibility you do allow a pathway for a waiver if necessary um, but it's just in keeping with existing setbacks or setbacks associated with anticipated future development which again that's very difficult to figure out but it's not as subjective of the character of the area Then I am deleting altogether that applicants can apply for a variance because you can't really can't anticipate future development of the area. I mean, I, I, I get the why you would want to do that, but I'm not sure how you do that. 
I mean, you can. Um, that assumes that we're thinking that the future development of some most of our areas are already built. So you would be thinking you're changing the or trying to allow for more change. I, I guess I don't agree with their main premise, which is that um, using the existing character of the neighborhood is a bad way to to uh, make a judgment because. I think if you asked most of the homeowners, they would say, why did you buy here? Well, we like the character, right? So it would, I would be less comfortable telling people that what they are familiar with is subject to change. One of the biggest issues that you find with people that are upset and coming in front of the planning commission or review board is somebody is proposing a development on the neighboring property that's not they didn't know was allowed like i'm putting a gas station in next to my single family house and, and you know, the argument usually goes something like well did the zoning change or was that always possible right and if and if it was always possible then okay well you just didn't know that's that's not our issue if you change the zoning and now that's allowed and now i hate my neighborhood that's something that I don't know that we should be responsible. I think that puts a, a, a the average homeowner in a bad position. Yeah, I'm not sure I would put this issue at the same scale only because we're simply talking about trying to waive the front setback, which is hardly ever going to happen. But, but yeah, those are extreme examples, but but they have. So uh, I, I'm, I really like the lot line, you know, like don't just set a number, let's allow the average of the um, adjacent. Yeah. Properties. That's fine, no problem with that. Um, trying to, um, I mean, most of our language, at least in the historic section and village center, talks specifically about making sure that new development is sensitive to and respectful and, and somehow harmonious with existing surrounding neighborhood character. So um, I don't know that we want that to go away everywhere. Um, OK, so I can reject this. Um, so I, I will push a little harder on pulling out this concept of an applicant can apply for a variance. Um, because, because this. Yeah, so. It's not really what a variance is for. No, it's not really what a variance is for. And it's not really something that the former CPA should be approving either. You're not allowed to self-inflict a, uh, you know, a problem and go for, for uh, really, like I want Correct. the house to be further back or not be in the setback area. And I think I sh you should allow it for me. Yeah. Course. Yeah. Okay, so that sounds good. Um, so I think that is, it basically um there are some other stuff um we want to put in something about sheds yes that's not in this chapter okay i just yeah that's right chapter it's chapter seven, seven. yeah yeah mm -hmm. so that's coming up next patrick was give me the eye so <laughs> um did you figure out what language you want i have it somewhere on my desk when i get back into the office Okay, just email it to me. Um, and is it okay if they're on skids and you can move them around versus permanent? Just give John a call. John, Johnny on the spot. Somebody in our neighborhood put in a lovely shed. It's it's on you know big eight by eights or something. Presumably they could just take it away whenever they want. So I don't. I think we should be. Sure, that's not a tiny home. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody living. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, all right, I'm just looking through the rest of this chapter. Um, I think we're good. There's the similar sort of pictures of intent in the overlay. Um, so, I think I think that's it. And so, do we get through all? all four of the things you sent us this time we need to go through the 
Is that the conditional use chart? Um, the except the use table. Do we need to go through that. So the use table. Um, yeah, I guess we should just confirm. So, because I think we started at this question and then maybe circled away from it. Um, triplexes in R1 and R2. We're good with it with the one required parking space and the maximum 40% lot coverage. Yep. Understanding that that might be difficult in R2 because the lots are so small, but. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Um, I think that's it. One thing before we go, I just want to ask the PC members to take a look and I mentioned for but it's germane to what we've been talking about tonight. Uh, if you check out Design Five Corners from June 7th, 11th, 13th, and 15th, and maybe even, uh, um, I've been on a sort of quad crusade about the way roads are designed in urban spaces in Vermont. They seem to use the same metrics as they do almost for motorways. So I've been suggesting some changes to uh, our people from RSG, actually I've been talking to most, uh, but 7, 11, 13, 15, uh, it's different things. It's about cycling. It's about creating good streets, uh, parking minimums. And it might be something worth looking at and maybe it can feed back in the next time you meet, maybe not. So is that when I go to the website? Can I, you I can... email us those, those specific references again, just so we don't, and I know you look at Design Five Corners every day. You're just trying to make everybody else feel better. I got it right next to me here. <laughs> so you're talking about pages 7, 11, 13, and 15? No, I'm talking about dates in June, John, that I posted it on Design Five Corners. I go to yeah. great lengths researching stuff to put it on Design Five. I, I explained to people that I'm trying to make Design Five Corners Facebook site aspirational, not confrontational. Okay. Oh, it's a Facebook site. It's Facebook. Yeah, you're asking a lot, Buster. Oh, I gotta reactivate which, that thing to which dates to again? Look at this, Robin. Uh, seven, eleven, thirteen, fifteen. You can go back for years, but those four would be enough to get you going. Get your juices flowing. Though. Months are those days are those days. Are days. Years. Dates. 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 <laughs> and don't be eating those. Don't be eating those dates. Eleven. So like July eleventh kind of thing. No, we're in June, John. November seventh. This, this is recent. He's European. Oh. Do you have some month. questions if we're done with this conversation? Yes. I'm done. Um, <laughs> so. Get me on. Send us a link, Robin, or you're not going to get us all on the same page. That sounds like a good idea. Not even the same Facebook page. Okay, June thirtieth, we are meeting. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So we decided. Yes. So, yes. Um, are you sure that this group should become the DRB? Because this, all we've been working on, is just going to fall flat if we can't well, move it forward. Yeah. Well, I, I think it has to be a slow transition. The thing is that once we finish this, in theory, a planning commission doesn't have a lot on its plate, whereas the DRB will. So if we could continue until we complete this and then look at um, who's on the DRB and who's not, that seems to be a sequence that would work pragmatically. Yeah, like if we could, so, I mean, in some kind of ideal world, we could have, everything on the table on the 30th, which really the only big other chapter is chapter seven. And so long as we're not doing anything new, which cannabis is still question mark. Um, yeah, we really need to get something in about that though in some form. I can give an update on cannabis. Well, not a whole update, but I'm part of a cannabis working group with Raj and a couple other people. And we're meeting on next Wednesday, I believe is our first meeting. And I know that there is desire from the trustees to do something like outside of this normal LDC process. So there might be some changes that happen outside of that, just like we had talked about last time. Yeah. And they all have to be in lockstep with what this Yeah, and, and Raj is aware of 
the timing as far as warning all the meetings and warning the hearings and all of that for those approvals. So I'll know more after that meeting so I can bring more information to that June 30th meeting. Okay. Because it would be it would be helpful if what we're working on right now, if we can just be done with it on the 30th, warn a hearing on the 30th for this package, then nothing prevents other packages from coming, but this at least gets across the finish line. Um, and then if you folks are the only uh, willing volunteers and need to switch to the DRP, <laughs> then at least this thing is kind of on its way. Yeah, I would agree with that. Because I, unfortunately, I'm getting, um, I got an email that, that said I needed to make a decision by the end of the month. Either continue really? or... Yeah. So, yeah. Because my, my term ends on June 30th. Oh. What was that? No idea. Um, Scott's out of shape. We just had some kind of crazy sound come through. Okay. Yeah, so, we all heard it, but we don't. Oh, okay. It, it, okay. It, it, asking that question in, in our transition here, you know, you know the, the deadline's already been set as to, you know, we're supposed to change, um, but we're not done. So how do we, how do we continue to do our planning commission stuff if we become the DRV, are we allowed to do this technically? No. Okay. Robin, has the advertisement for the DRV gone out? As far as I know, I'll have to check. In French Port Forum twice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that. So hopefully there's more people. And I was thinking like Andrew, he might be willing to come back to be on the DRV. I don't think so. Hmm. Um. So, okay. Yeah, I don't know the solution, but I, I selfishly I, know that, I want the planning commission to not go away. <laughs> I know that, so just so everyone knows, I gave my intention to stay on the planning commission in the change to the city, but I'll serve where needed. But I, I know that we can't serve on both boards, right. but nothing says we can't join the meeting and speak as public and as previous, uh, members to help advise the new commission so yeah unfortunately we just wouldn't have a vote we just need we just need voters <laughs> it, it's the quorum part is that yeah we have at least three people on there yeah. so for this project to continue we need at least three people so we're it <laughs> unless we can convince you know, that there are our zoning <clears throat> members of which there are two if they want to pop in and join the fun um you know, i do know someone personally that george has been courting for the planning commission well, someone put I your found name that forward. out recently someone put your name forward um a while back but i haven't heard any result okay so maybe it's all gonna work out but uh we of course it will I will be working to get you folks a final product without cannabis by June 30th. Yeah. I think that's fair. That's great. Okay. Awesome. All right. Any further business tonight? Um, uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. Oh, Phil, be me too. Phil, seconded by Diane. All in favor say aye. 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 Yeah, thank you very much. That was most uh, interesting tonight. Yes, thank you, Regina. You're welcome. A lot of <laughs> thank you for the tough decision making. It's hard. Yeah. All right. We all.